Good evening. About uh, two weeks ago, uh, I read a, uh, a, an alarming statistic that 20%, 20% of cancer trials, trials for new drugs for cancer, fail. Not because the drug fails, not because uh, there are harmful effects of the drugs, but because the trials for the drugs, no matter how promising, can't find patients for the study. They fail because no, in, in the most dire and in the most devastating disease of all, with patients who really are looking for any solution, we fail at finding ways of connecting the patients to the trial. Now, for me, that explained a lot about my own life and my own career. I've been very lucky for 35 years to be a funded investigator studying brain and behavior relationships and really uh, being very, being able to study diseases and how they impact brain and cognitive function. It's been a fascinating and amazing privilege to be able to do that. But about 10 years ago, uh, the National Institute of Health uh, decided, as they looked around at, at all the work they had funded uh, during a, during the pre previous 20 or 30 years, that the public really didn't have a lot concrete to show for all the research they had funded, particularly within the biological sciences, and in my own field, the neurosciences. So they began a program of uh, funding and encouraging the idea that we would go from bench to bedside, that we would use our basic research and not just do the basic research just because it was interesting, but now do that basic research with a goal in mind, that it's going to help society, that it's going to be applicable. And I was very lucky about uh, 10 years ago, uh, I was uh, asked to join one of the conferences down in Bethesda, convened by National Institute of Health, where we had several groups of us and we had, uh, we had work groups to discuss the prospects in, in, in a variety of different disorders of how we would go from some of our basic science findings to usable answers to, with that information. And uh, we all wrote papers as groups, as these study groups, and that's where we left it. Around the same time, I got, at that time I got really, it really, I decided that it really was my obligation to do something useful, not just do something that I thought was interesting. Around that time, I was invited by some of my colleagues uh, who were uh, starting, I can't tell you where, uh, who had been funded by a private agency with a, an, an astounding amount of money, actually $30 million, to develop a translational research center for stroke and stroke recovery. It was an amazing idea, and it brought together some of the greatest scientists I knew and had heard of in one place basic sciences, scientists interested in, in systems-level brain behavior relationships, as well as neurologists and psychiatrists and practitioners. It was an ideal mix. It was an ideal intellectual brew that, to me, seemed to be, for sure, would be able to solve the problems of stroke recovery, if anybody could. And uh, every year, I was on the, I I was, on their external scientific review board with several other scientists. And each year we came back and we looked at their progress. And after a couple of years, we realized that although they had some incredibly great minds working on this with incredible resources, two or three years down the line, they really weren't getting anywhere. So we suggested to them that maybe what the problem was is, well, they weren't really talking to each other enough. They were really working on their own thing. And to translate, they really had to work with each other. They had to find a way of, of speaking a common language that would bring the basic science into something useful. But the other big problem was that although they had some of the largest centers in that particular place, to study the kinds of patients they were interested in, 
they had not yet identified even a single patient who they could study, who they could try out some of the great innovations and ideas that they were developing. So we began advising them that they really had to invest in resources for doing that. Each year we would go back, each year we would visit them, and we would go around to uh, the poster sessions that they would, they would use to show us some of the interesting ideas. And every year we saw some amazingly innovative ideas both in pharmacology and in using methods of psychology that would be applicable to helping patients with strokes. But in each case, the studies they showed on these posters had one or two individuals in the study. They were simple little case control studies. And we would say, that's a fantastic idea. That looks really promising. Why don't you bring it to a trial? Why don't you do a controlled study? And the following year, we would come back, and there would be another series of innovative posters and innovative ideas and no controlled studies. And this went on and on for a decade. They never found the patients because the way science is done and the way we all do our science is we focus on what we're interested in, but not on this endpoint, not connecting what we do at the bench with the patients at the bedside. That story has been repeated in my own experience over and over again here in Boston in one of the, one of the epicenters of great medical science where if you walk, if you go to the other end of Cambridge by Kendall Square, all around you will be incuba in incubators of, a, of bio biotechnology and ideas. In every office in some of the buildings around you, there is a group of people who have patented a molecule with great promise that could potentially solve a number of medical problems and diseases. Yet, if you watch those molecules and you follow them, you'll see that most of them remain in a purgatory, never being tested. A purgatory of great scientific ideas that are never connected to patients. We fund the great ideas. We're great at funding molecular biology. We're great at funding neuroscience. We're great at funding studies of the brain. But we did never figured out in the 10 years and that NIH convened that conference how to find patients and bring them together with innovative potential treatments. We do it very poorly. We don't fund it. The only way that it's funded now is through the pharmaceutical industry. If it's easily monetized, it'll be funded. And uh, you know what's easily mon mon uh, monetized, but all you have to do is see the TV commercials in the evening, and you know what kinds of drugs uh, drug companies find profitable. But there are many, many potential innovations, there are many, many disorders, many, many diseases that need attention, not only through pharmaceutical intervention, but through psychological intervention, through psychotherapies. All of these trials have the same problem. We don't know how to connect them. We don't understand how to put patients together with potential treatments. Six years ago, uh, the Department of Defense and Congress uh, put out an announcement that, the vet, that soldiers who are fighting in, in Af Iraq and Afghanistan were coming back to the United States with a tremendous rate of brain injuries and other disorders related to being in combat. And working in the VA, we were actually directed to try to, uh, to try to do something about that. So we put in for a Center of Excellence grant. And the basis of our Center of Excellence grant, we had learned this lesson that we need to know something about patients. So we devoted the set, we got funded, and instead of just starting out right away and uh, indulging our, our ideas, we built infrastructure built infrastructure for finding patients, recruiting patients, making the, the, our, our, our participants understand that there was a possibility of treating the problems that they had. Before we even started thinking about the basic sciences that inevitably we would have to think about. At this time, well, around the same time, there was another center, I remember at our, at our uh, site visit, we were told that our competition was another center in Texas. 
And they were thinking that although we had some great ideas for the science we wanted to do, they really wanted to fund the center in Texas because they had many times more veterans with the kinds of problems that we were interested in. And in fact, if you looked at the statistics, they had about 10 times as many veterans in, um, in that part of the, of the country than we did. But what they didn't think about, and what we did think about, is although they had many more veterans uh, who had served with potential brain injuries in Texas, uh, we had fewer veterans in New England, but they lived within an hour of our hospital. And we pleaded population density and logistics as being the critical issue that logistics was going to win out over numbers. And it turned out that we were correct. So in 2016, we have the largest sample ever studied of these sorts of patients in with greater detail than had ever been studied before. Whereas, the, unfortunately, the center in Texas couldn't get anybody. They got, in five years, about 20 patients to come in and be part of their studies because their patients were spread out over thousands of miles. This is the case. It was a lesson, and our patients and our participants are enrolled in trials, and our patients are connected all the time with some of the studies that we do. This is a problem that we need to solve, we need to fund. We need a science of translation. We need to understand what it is it takes to bring patients together with scientific innovation. I knew that in the five minutes that I had today that I really wouldn't be able to explain very much about what I do on a daily basis. But what I felt I could tell you was a, about was a problem. And having an audience of an unusually curious individuals and creative individuals, perhaps you will have the opportunity to work on this problem now that you know what it is. Thank you.